Hello and welcome to Tim's BMW Repairs and Information and today it's all about my favourite mod that I've done to my E31 8 series. I've done a few to it, uh, for instance LEDs, I've got LED main beams, FTP, side lights, number plate lights, indicators, LEDs everywhere and they work really well in the E31 and I've already done a series about that. Uh, apart from LEDs, we've got three-spoke steering wheel. I thought the four-spoke one looked like it came out of a tractor. And era-specific Becker sat-nav as well. And because it plays MP3 CDs, I've got CD storage as well. All with the correct stuff, all made by BMW. Got a Wi-Fi remote-controlled dash cam, and that picks up all sorts of interesting stuff and uh, stainless steel exhaust, Rondal 58s, they really suit the car as well. But this modification we're going to go through today is my favourite of all of them and it really comes into its own in the dark evenings when I'm driving home from work and you're alone there in the middle of the road and you're bathed in a warm orange light. Yep, ambient lighting, I really love it in the E31. It was never provided with ambient lighting even though the E38 got it and quite a few other cars, the E31 didn't. And this modification will work on E31, E32 and E34 because they all share the same interior light. And it's the modification to the interior light that provides the ambient lighting. Right, before I show you exactly how to make it and what bits you need and stuff like that, let's take it out for a drive and I'll show you what it looks like because it it really does make a difference to the interior of the car. Right, what we need to do is we need to find somewhere without street lights and then we get a much better view of it. Right, don't need to go far around where I live. Street lamps don't last for long around here. But let's get on our way. Right, we're away from the street lamps now and I've stopped the car and we can have a good look at the ambient lighting. Well, first of all, I'll turn it down. So that's what it looks like without the ambient lighting on. And you can see all the backlit controls. But as you turn up the ambient lighting, it really does bring up that sort of warm glow you get on the later models of BMW. And it does make it so much easier to see where all the controls are. Now the video doesn't really do it justice because it really is a lovely orange glow you get. And uh, especially in those winter, the long winter drives at night, it just makes the car feel so much more welcoming uh, when you open the door, get this lovely orange glow that you see in much later models. But let's get on with it. I'll show you how it's done. Right, let's have a look at how it's connected in the car. In we go. Of course, as soon as we come on, come in, the LEDs are on. I haven't got the interior light switched on, but you can see those LEDs are running. So this is the sort of the, the source of the lovely ambient light. Two LEDs and a potentiometer fitted to the interior light. So that's all that gets modified in here. And I'll show you exactly how to get the LED out. That's if I can hold on to the camera with one hand and use a trim tool with the other. Here we go. So a trim tool goes in there, wiggle it in. Make sure you get the, <laughs> don't separate the uh, interior light because it's easy to get in there and that's, we're actually separating the interior light, but get above it, then the interior light can come out and there's our connector. So we just got to disconnect that and then we can just take the, interior light out of the car and I won't do it because as I've explained many times uh, I've got a dash cam connected to that and the dash cams connected to those exactly the same two points as well they're connected to the negative and the 16 minute timer as well 
um, so that my dash cam, which is under here, anyone touches a door handle, the dash cam comes on and it will stay on for 16 minutes. So anyone tries to fiddle with the car, dash cam's on and it's recording, it's recording audio and video. Oh, here comes Pippi. There he is. What's he up to? He's always up to no good, that cat. Anyway, beside the point. Yeah, so that, this is the source of the LED light, the lovely warm glow. And we've got a potentiometer to turn it up and down. And you can't see any of the wiring inside it. It's all hidden away, uh, as shown in the, the last bit as well. So anyway, let's get on with the actual job itself. So there, that's all you have to do. Trim tool at this end. Make sure you don't start separating the one half of the interior light from the other, uh, because that's very easy to do. And I just had right. I've gone back through the video of where I'm making this device, and the video isn't that high resolution. Well, it is, but it's just from too far away. So I thought what I'd do is I go through all the connections uh, while I hold the camera in my hand. We go through them a lot easier. Rightio, so we've got a positive supply here that's on the red wire and this positive supply um, from BMW it's soldered onto a large tang of metal which goes off in both directions actually goes to one side of the festoon bulb. Now you would have thought it'd be easier to solder to this tang here but it really doesn't want to take solder and I did have a go at doing that last time and it stayed on for a couple of years okay but if you give it a bit of a tug, it just snaps off again. And that's even heating this fully up and using a flux as well. It really didn't work. So it's much better to solder to this point here because it's already got solder on it. Um, because BMW solder this red wire onto it here. So that's our positive supply and it's positive, which comes on immediately to open a door handle, lift up a door handle, this supply comes on and it will stay on through all your driving and everything and when you lock the car and leave it for 16 minutes this goes off again so you leave your car and for 16 minutes the interior is bathed in a lovely orange light and i really do like that uses so little electricity doesn't make any difference to the current drain on the battery and i remember doing a write-up of this on one of the forums and so the bloke said i'm not doing that it's going to drain my battery what, 20 milliamps, mate? No, make a slightest bit of difference. You leave it on for the whole life of the car, if you like, and it's not going to flatten the battery. Anyway, this is where we solder on. So that's the positive supply, the 16 minute supply. It's called lift the door handle, it's on, drive and drive, and it only goes off when it's been locked for 16 minutes. And our negative supply we take off of here, which is the back side of the switches. And there's a sort of bare bit of wire here, which is great to solder on to. So negative supply times 16 uh, minute 12 volt supply. So the way it's wired up is I've got a black wire that runs along here and along here to the small terminal of the potentiometer. There's three terminals and I've gone on to the clockwise, uh, anti-clockwise one from the large tang because there's a big tang and two smaller ones. So I've gone anti-clockwise when looking from the back from the large tang. The large tang then connects to the long leg of this LED. So there's the LED in its little bung and stuck, in, stuck into the bezel. So that's the long leg. And then the short leg goes along here. I've heat shrunk that because it gets quite near to this tang, the positive tang. Got a 220 ohm resistor in there, one watt. And then we go off and we solder to the long leg of this. LED. So we've got the long leg going to the potentiometer, short leg goes to the resistor, long leg of this one goes to here, and then the short leg goes to negative. So that's our supply, goes round here, positive supply, through the potentiometer, through one LED, through the resistor, through the other LED, back to negative. And I've drawn the circuit out, vaguely anyway. So there's our 12 volt supply, which I pointed at to start with go to one of the smaller tangs of the potentiometer and the wiper of the potentiometer, which is the larger tang, goes down to the long leg of the first LED, positive supply, uh, to the anode. So positive is anode on LEDs. Cathode or negative goes to our resistor. Long leg of this, resist, uh, to, of this LED 
short LED of the LED goes to the negative terminal, the one which goes onto the back of the switches. Now, if we wanted the potentiometer to actually switch the LED completely off, then we could run a separate wire from the other small tang and we'd run that to the negative supply. But I much prefer just to have uh, this on all the time. So I don't have this connected at all. So even at the minimum setting right down here, we've got 1K plus 220 ohms and you get about I don't know, three or four milliamps through the LEDs. Uh, it still produces a reasonable glow. And with the potentiometer right at the top, then we're sticking close to 50 milliamps through these LEDs, well, close to 40 milliamps through the LEDs at 14.6 volts. Of course, the 12 volt supply on a car, you, although it's 12 volts, it actually reaches 14.6 when the battery is fully charged and the alternator is running. So all the calculations are current are done with 14.6 volts. And these are tiny little feeble LEDs because we don't want much light out of it. You'll be surprised how much light you get out of these. So there we go, there's the wiring. And of course the uh, resistor is 220 ohms, one watt. Uh, these are 20 milliamp LEDs. We do push them a bit harder, but they're quite happy. 1K ohm, that's 1000 ohm linear potentiometer. And those lovely uh, ingot uh, waterproof potentiometers, they're really good. Don't need a knob stuck to them. You don't need to saw the shaft off of them. You don't have to mess about with grub screws. No, they're lovely. I do love them and I've used them for yonks now. They don't look too bad at all. Okie doke. So we'll go through all of that. We'll go through all the actions of putting stuff together. And uh, I'll explain, well, I might explain why we have to have a resistor in there. And we'll also go through our LEDs as well because we've got, I've got a few different LEDs that uh, for trying. And as long as you get a diffuse 20, 20 millimetre Oh, sorry, 20 milliamp, three millimetre LED um, with a diffused beam, then that's fine. The only ones you can't use are the ones with uh, a clear lens because they bung out circles of light and that just wouldn't look good. So either this one here, this one's a nice one. And even though that says best on it, they're actually the clear ones. And there we go, that's the ones we used. Anyway, we'll go through all the part numbers and so on, and we'll go exactly how to do it. And it's good fun, I tell you, just take your time. Not sure if you're still in lockdown. We sort of are. Um, a lot of people have gone back to work. Uh, I didn't actually stop working uh, for any length of time. I was doing two days and then three days and then back to five days. So if you're still in lockdown, this is a perfect job to do it. Just. <laughs> You need cheap old soldering iron. I've got this old Tenma one here. Cost about 40 quid. I've had it for a, a few years and it works fine. It's a bit cheap and nasty, um, but it does the job. I think it's a 40 watt iron, temperature controlled, digital controlled one. Um, so yeah, that works fine. So that's all you need for the sold, soldering iron. Solder, you've got a lead, uh, what's it solder. Uh, you can use silver solder, but then you have to heat things up a lot, lot to higher temperatures where this old uh, lead tin solder, 6040, that's what you use for years. And uh, yeah, that's a lot easier to solder than, than the, the silver stuff. Uh, because as I say, it has to get a lot holder, a lot hotter. So yeah, soldering iron, cheap old soldering iron, drills, drill, um, side cutters, bit of wire and uh, oh yeah nine volt battery so you can check things out um, I'll go through how to actually test the LEDs and the reason why I don't just connect LEDs across the nine volt battery because they go pop they have to use them in series with uh, resistor so we go through absolutely everything but I'm glad we've got a close-up look of everything because I didn't get a close-up while I was actually <laughs> doing the work right let's get on with it of course the first thing we have to do to our interior light and uh, I didn't great, great video footage of it, is obviously to drill the holes. Now, of course, this unit here is my original one, which didn't have a potentiometer, so you will see me drilling this hole, which is 10 mil, rather badly, of course. There we go. Let's do a pilot hole to start with. About there.
yeah more melting than drilling there we go pilot hole in so we're going to go backwards there we go one hole now the reason I went backwards is because uh, this stuff which is obviously polycarbonate is very easy to fracture and if you've got a sharp drill bit like this one then it will catch and it will really uh, just crack the polycarbonate righty out so does that fit oh what I should have done of course is before we do that put the wire on it that makes life a lot easier so get those bits back out again right bit of wire that's what we need so I've got a bit of wire we just put a length of wire on it and which end should we go to we'll go to so if we go to the tang that means we've got to go the big tang that means we've got to go to the LED and that's not a problem we can do the big tang to the LED while it's in there what we do is we go to the smaller tang um, so we'll want to go to so if we have a look at this we've got the big tang there and what we want to do is go to this one here uh, because that's the furthest clockwise uh, so that would be the the flat out one if you like so that we need to connect to that one rather than the other smaller tang uh, because then the knob will work back to front it's always best to have these work so that that's the dimmest that's the brightest and that's clockwise so if you look underneath from the tang you go anti-clockwise and that's the one we've got to connect to okie dokes it all makes sense honestly so we've got a bit of wire we'll just strip a bit of it at the end there we go tin it uh, with a bit of solder I'll sit back down again find my iron hidden beneath drills now of course and there's my other drill right, got them out of the way so yeah got our solder um, just a bit of tinning on it so just get some solder onto the wire makes it a bit easier to solder it on there we go that's on so that can now go to the tang that I bent over which is that one there yeah we should get my glasses never mind bend him over like that and then we'll solder that into place with a sort of wire just dangling out Oops, pulled it out again. There we go. Solder that on through the tripod with the iron. There we go. He's soldered on. Right, how he soldered onto that tang. So that's good. Then we chop off just a length of wire, it's about four or five inches. No need to be any longer than that. So about that long, and then we'll stick that up through the hole. This means we don't have to do so much soldering down in the bottom of this which makes life a bit easier I'll twiddle him round, he's in I think what I'll do is I'll have him that position there for flat out and then we can turn it back down for off and so on that's about right um, but of course we'll have to twiddle it round anyway because we've got to get the washer on there and the nut <clears throat> and it's a lot easier to twiddle the potentiometer around than it is the nut down here I'll get some long nose pliers and do it obviously but it's easy just to turn the potentiometer and it's not as though we need these 
critically tight they're not an engine component we just need them nipped up right first thing we've got to do is put the little rubber bungs on these fellas on our leds a bit fiddly so it goes sort of round end in There we go, so that's two of them in the rubber bung. And what we do is we mark the shorter leg uh, because once we start bending things, it's difficult to tell which is which. So we're gonna mark the shorter leg, which is the cathode. Otherwise it does get a bit confusing. There we go, so, <coughs> excuse me, so we know green equals cathode, or negative, whichever you fancy. Right, the easiest way to measure how long the legs have to be on the first bend is obviously to fit it in here, so it takes a bit of fiddling, a pair of tweezers, Get hold of the rubber bung and push it in. There we go, that's the bung in. Check the other side to make sure it's not protruding too far because obviously you, you only want it right down in the hole, otherwise if you have it sticking out it's going to go everywhere. So that's fine. And now we can work out that it's got to bend. You can't have it too high because it will hit the reflector. So let's get a bend in it about there. Straighten out my other bend that I put in earlier. There we go, that's about the right height and the other one can do the same. Now pop him out. So we know the bend's got to be about there. So I put a pop proper bend in it now. I put a right angle in it instead of going off at a funny angle. And then I'll double check that that's okay again. There we go, that's him straight. Green's still on it, so we know it's the short leg. I did this the other day and uh, forgot which, le which leg was which and <laughs> just waste a complete 10 minutes or so trying to work out which way's which. Okie doke, so he's about the right height. Now this is the back, the reflector, and we obviously got to get underneath that. And they're funny old things, you put in the, I think it's the right, it has to be up at uh, 90 degrees. Put one side in first, which is obviously this side, and then push it that way, and it, both sides are in. And then we can lay it down and check that we're not too close to that. Well, I reckon we can go a couple of millimetres lower than that is just to be on the safe side, so we'll do that. But it will, of course, have heat shrink on it as well. So it's not going to short out to anything, but I'm going to bring it down to about here. And of course, that distance all depends on which bezel you you've have used. So it would be slightly different, each bezel to another. OK, so we've still got green on it, so we know which one's which. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we do the anode on the other one. So he knows we've got to bend it very close to where that one is, which is about there. Gotcha. So I put a bending in there. Of course, this side's not so critical uh, because it doesn't hit anything. So we've got it about right. Yeah, that's fine. And then we know it has to be this distance apart. So the next thing we have to think about is heat shrink, because we need to heat shrink this bit. And also got to find the resistor, of course, there it is. So we know it's got to go along there. Doesn't matter which way round resistors go, by the way. 
and make one I iota of difference. Okay, so this bit here we need heat shrink on and uh, the problem with heat shrink of course is as you work on something you heat it up the heat shrink shrinks which is a bit of a nuisance. Um, so we can have the resistor the other way round so we've got a a longer distance that we can put the heat shrink on but that's got to be soldered first anyway but this heat shrink goes over the resistor so we're good to go there so do it the other way round and um, we can solder things together first before we need to put the heat shrink on so we can solder it just like this we can just put the soldering iron down but if you're cat handed like I am then you can use blue tack um, make sticks things in position while you solder them together so I use a bit of heat shrink for both bits like that and I hold it close together and that gives us two hands free to uh, get hold of the solder and the soldering iron of course if you heat it up too long um, then the blue tack melts, so you don't really want to take too long doing this. There we go. He's sort of soldered together, isn't he? Could do a bit going a bit further over. There we go, that's better. Right, so that's him done. And now put the heat shrink over. And this is why I've done one side longer than the other, is that we can get the heat shrink on and round without getting in the way of the next solder joint. So we can heat shrink the resistor and the wire quite happily. And then as long as we're quite quick doing the next solder, solder joint, then uh, it's not going to heat uh, shrink round everything we're trying to do, which is a bit of a nuisance. So we don't need to heat shrink down there, but we will anyway like that, straighten them up a bit, get them round the corner, there we go, that's far enough, put the bend back in it, there we go, so that's that with a little bit of heat shrink round it, so that's going to protect it from everything can use a heat gun to do this but if you use the sort of this area of the soldering iron um, it'll do just as well well not just as well but that's all we've got we haven't got a heat gun here there we go that's all we need to do really That'll just protect it from the, the little metal tang in the light unit. So the next thing we do is we solder, solder the other end. So we get all this lined up and we keep our distance between the lights. About there. No need for heat shrink on this end. Which is handy because it would be awkward. There we go, good old blob of solder on there, that's what we need. And that's it, that's that assembly done. Get all the blue tack back off again, of course it's heated up and it'll stick on everywhere. So just dab it back off again. There we go. Right, and uh, yeah, this is the point where you think oh green that is the right end so that's good um, but you can obviously double check something like this if you're really worried to check which is the positive and the negative because we've got the resistor in there now we can just get a battery and then we could easily see which is the positive and the neg negatives so there we go 
we know that leg because it's got negative marked on the side of the battery. We know this one's negative, the green end's negative, both LEDs are lit up. Also, you can't do that without a resistor because it will just pop the LED. Um, so yeah, you need a resistor in series with it. So there we go, that's the way it's going to go round. So we can get our thingy bob here. So this is going to go over this bar here. And then we need to solder this leg onto this terminal of the potentiometer. Uh, probably best if we had it directly upwards. Uh, more chance of getting the LED in there. So what we could do is bring it around a bit more. Uh, we can possibly put the leg through that to start with and then we can sort of fit the LED in the hole. Not sure which one's going to be easiest actually. It might be better just to do a lay joint. So what we do is we put the LEDs in the holes and squash the little rubber doofers in. There we go, get all of the rubber doofers. There we go, that's one in. Another one a bit underneath the edge of the plastic, but we're okay. Right, so they're both in and quite happy. Right, so the next thing we do is this has to go to the negative, which is, I'll just move this wire out of the way, make it a bit easier. So yeah, green leg, the negative leg, or the, the anode, we now need to get out of the way of this hinge, because obviously this is where it hinges. Getting along there quite malleable you can sort of push the legs around and so on like that get him out of the way of the hinge so I'll give him a poke further down there we go that's out of the way of the hinge and then there's the negative connection just there tweezers are a bit too weedy for this don't need all that wire sticking out so get rid of that and down next to the negative wire so nice and close there just get it close enough to get a good old blob of solder on there and that that's close enough I think make sure my LED wires aren't shorted out and they're not okay soldering iron solder Okay. If you need to use some flux here, which is what I think I'll do, otherwise that's just gonna lay on top there. Bit of flux, circuit works. As tacky flux, always use this stuff, it's brilliant. Uh, CW8700. It's a fantastic flux. I mean, I've used it for a few years now and I won't use anything else now because it just works so well. I've got to get heat into the joint so the solder starts flowing, which it has done there. There we are. That's in. And then we can put this wire back in. Like that. There we go. Then the next thing we've got to do is connect this connector to the, the longer tang of the potentiometer. And for this, I think what we'll do is we'll pull that down a bit like that. Do another lay joint, nothing exciting. Snip off the excess bits of stuff out and getting blue tech out of the way otherwise everything's going to stick there we go so what we're close enough not quite and also need a bit more snipped off there we go so we're just going to go that's the one side of that so the wires are touching now bit of flux well why not got it might as well use it 
There we go, a bit of flux on that. Solder and iron. There we go, he soldered on nicely. And of course we soldered this wire onto the potentiometer um, before we put it in, soldered it to the potentiometer, screwed the potentiometer in. Makes life a bit easier because we now haven't got to solder that black wire on there. And the last solder joint we got to make, so I'll just push this out of the way a bit, is to this connection here. Now the last time I did it, I just soldered it to here but it really doesn't take solder that well. So let's get that bulb out of the way. And we can manipulate this a bit more. My bung's coming out half out, so push him back in again. Right, so we've got to solder to that. So this wire's going to go around the side here. We could take it up over there or underneath that lot, I suppose we could. Make it look neater. So we need to cut it to about there. Is that long enough? Probably a bit too long. That'll do though. Just strip the wire off of it. There we go. Tin that, a bit of solder. There we go, he's tinned. And now we've got to solder to this point here, which way is best for you to see this? Probably that way. So we've got solder to this point here. So we're definitely going to use some flux on that uh, to get that solder flowing. And then it's just a matter of soldering the black wire onto there. So for this, I need more hands. So I'm going to use a big lump of blue tack. There we go. I'll hold him in position. Blue tack, brilliant for soldering. Righty ho, let's see if we can heat all of that up. This is a large lump of metal and quite a feeble soldering iron, but I think we'll do it. It shouldn't be a problem. The only problem is it might melt plastic. Yeah, that's certainly flowing now, so I'll get my bit of wire in position, heat it up again and just lay that joint on. Let's get it so, uh, going again. There get it on there. It's nice and hot and solder the wire on. It looked like it was on but it's not. Give it another heat up. He's on there that time. Let it cool down. There we go. Right. Okay, let's see if he's soldered on to start with, which he is. So I think what we'll do is we could run it underneath there. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just pull these wires out a bit. Oh, we can't get that one that far out, actually, because obviously it's soldered to that and that so it's not going to move so it's going to have to go underneath the first one so I'll poke those back in again and we'll run it round there and round that tang if he goes that is Not that keen, could have been a bit longer that wire. There we go, put him back through there. I think what I have to do is I have to turn that potentiometer, which I can't. Can't turn the potentiometer. So what I we'll probably have to do is pull it out of here, over that one first, get that wire out of the way. It will give us a bit more room 
get it over there first. There we go. Push him down into there. It's gonna go. Nah, he's gonna have to solder it again. Never mind. These things are sent to try us. Easier said than done, unsoldering, of course. It's a quite a large lump of metal for a little iron. There you go. Right, we can now put him underneath there. Squash him on top with that one there. And hold it all into position. And just in case of soldering him back on again. So I've lay him next to the red wire. Okay. That's it, it's flowing now. That right, pippy. Yeah, a bit dangerous here, boy. Got to put a hot soldering iron down, you know. No, that's not string, it's solder. Oh, for goodness sake. Oh, goodness sake, come on. Off you go, Fatty. Let's get you out of the way. It's hot and dangerous. Righty-ho. Big not from a solder. It's made out of lead, you know. There, got rid of him. Righty out, let's sort of bend things back into position and we're just about done. Make sure nothing's shorting out. Doesn't look like it. That's good. Get him out of the way. Can't see it from the other side, that was the important thing. This wire's got to be down there. And then the reflector goes, but oh, I'll put the bowl back in, that's a good idea. They're damn fit. I tell you, the number plate like ones, they are nigh on impossible to do, those ones, because it's down a hole and you can't get your fingers on it or anything. It's a real pain. Now, uh, as we said, which uh, this is it. So for these things, you put this side in first, push it all the way downwards, and then push it back upwards, and then both sides stay in. And it just goes into position, just make absolutely sure nothing's hitting. Uh, we're a good distance from anything. And there we go, and that should clip in there, but this clip's broken on that one. So we ignore that. A bit of blue tack, that probably fix it. Anyway, that's how it all goes back together again. As I say, just double check everything's lined up. LEDs can be seen. And that can go back in the car. Job done. Right, so to get the light out. What you do is you get a trim tool and you wiggle it quite a way up. Because if you don't wiggle it all the way up, <laughs> you pull the interior light in half. So you end up getting into, in between the bits of plastic there and you pull the lens off of it, which isn't great. Right. As I said, I've got a dash cam on mine, which I can't disconnect. Okay, so here's the connector. Pull that apart, like that. Yeah, don't use a screwdriver. It's all switched on at the moment. There we go. Right, disconnect him. And what we do is we dangle the other one off and see if it works. Right, let's plug in the replacement version. Just check that it works okay. Let's get up there. It's fiddly, this one is. I don't quite know why it's so fiddly, but it's always fiddly. There we go, he's in. And there we go. We've got LEDs. And dimmable ones at that too. So there we go. That's ready to go back in. 
But as I said, I've got my own one and that needs to go back in. 